Education and City Services Committee of CB5. Julie Chu is the co-chair of this committee and Luke is the man behind the scenes, but I'm behind the curtain running the Zoom. Um, it's the first time having our Zoom meeting, um, our BEX meeting on Zoom, but I assume everyone's now pretty familiar with the format. Um, just a reminder that the BEX committee meetings and the members of the public, the members of the public can see all of us while the committee members can only see the fellow board members. And this meeting is being recorded. I would ask that if you're not speaking, that you put yourself on mute. And if you'd like to speak, that, the use, that you use the raise hand function that you can find by clicking on participant at the bottom of your screen and then clicking on the raise hand function at the bottom right. Um, does anybody have any question about that format? Okay, so first I'd like to extend a hearty welcome. We have some new members on BEX, um, Mary Brosnahan, jo uh, Joseph Brewer, Brian Johnson and Jamie Khan. Welcome, welcome. We are so glad to have you. Thank you um, for joining our committee. We look forward to working with you. Um, our first, we have two agenda items. The first is a resolution on the community organics and recycling empowerment, the CORE Act legislation. It's intro 1942 and intro 1943. All of the committee members should have gotten a copy of that legislation that was sent to you earlier in the week. It's sponsored by Council Member Powers. And what the legislation will do is create compost and electronic drop-off sites. And that's to compensate right now for the recycling reductions um, that have resulted from the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, our second agenda item is gonna be a, a discussion of the effects of COVID on the district, our ideas, comments, thoughts about the best way to move forward. More of a free flowing conversation that is not our norm. A brief overview of how the committee works. Um, Abigail Bessler of Council Member Powers is gonna speak about the CORE Act. After her presentation is concluded, the committee will be permitted to ask questions. And when all of the questions have been answered, members of the public will be permitted to ask questions of the presenter as well. Once all of those questions have been addressed, the committee will go into business session. And that's when only members of the BEX committee discuss the issue amongst themselves and determine what action they will take on the resolution. Um, if, if a resolution is indeed the result, it'll be voted on by all present members of BEX. And if it passes, it'll be presented to the full board on June 11th for a vote. And that vote is the final position of CB5. With regard to our second agenda item tonight, it's going to be a little bit more free flowing. Um, and uh, I think it will be helpful if you have a question that has already been asked or an idea you agree with um, for a particular position that you don't restate the question or the position, but simply say you agree with so and so, so we can keep the meeting um, moving. Does anybody have any questions? Okay, I think I'm going to turn it over to Abigail on the issue of the core legislation. Great. Thank you for having me. And it's nice to see everyone, especially all the new members. Uh, congratulations again. Um, so I just came to talk about this bill. I'm very excited that you all have taken up this issue um, because it's a big issue in the city and one of the top, I think, uh, budget fights right now that we've been contacted about from constituents across our district um, and especially in the CB5 area. So uh, as you may know, we're facing a, a huge uh, budget deficit in the city right now. And as part of that, uh, we're looking at a lot of cuts to programs that um, have been really important to people across the city, uh, one of which is the composting program. So I thought I would start with, you know, talking a little bit about what's going on now, then talk about the bills a little bit, and then we can kind of go to questions. Um, so what's hap what we're facing now is 28, over 28 million in cuts to uh, recycling and composting in the city. So we're facing a $21.5 million cut in the voluntary curbside composting program, uh, which is you know, the program where you could actually put out compost curbside uh, we're facing a $3.5 million cut in the community compost project, which was the funding of um, community gardens and compost drop off sites throughout the city. Um, so before there were 175, I believe, uh, compost drop off locations in the city. Uh, so we're facing all of that has been obviously shut down for now, but we're also facing a permanent cut of that. 
And then we're facing also 2.5 million in our outreach and education budget around composting, as well as, and this is kind of the, relates to the Reynoso bill that is, uh, goes with Councilmember Powers bill, um, cuts to the curbside electronics program and safe disposal events for hazardous materials, which are both mandated by the state that you have to properly dispose of those items. So we basically have a state mandate, um, but are cutting the only way that people could actually do that. So that's a serious issue as well. So in response to all of this and with a lot of partnership with advocates around the city, uh, Councilmember Powers and Councilmember Reynoso introduced the Community Organics and Recycling Empowerment Act or the CORE Act, um, much easier to say. Um, that would allow for the recycling of organic and inorganic recyclables um, to be collected at disposal sites throughout the city. So it would not only preserve the city's drop off organic sites, um, but it would also create more equitable access to recycling. So our bill is 1942, which would require a minimum of three drop off composting sites in every community district. Um, so sites would be, have to be operational no later than June 1st, 2021, which is in the bill. Uh, they'd have to be open at least 20 hours a week for people to drop off uh, food waste. They'd have to be in a geographic area that's accessible to people, including people with disabilities and in close proximity to public transportation. So that's outlined in there um, for Department of Sanitation to actually select those sites. Um, requires some outreach and education to inform people about the sites and requires some reporting to the city about once they're in place about how those sites are being used. Um, the other bill, which is 1943, is sponsored by Council Member Reynoso, which would um, allow for the collection of electronics and possibly hazardous materials at those sites. So it would, it would um, uh, put all those streams together uh, into these central sites. Um, so with this legislation, around 177 sites would be preserved or created. So it's roughly replacing the, the sites we have one-to-one, -one, but it, the, the important thing is that we actually preserve that funding for that program that's at risk. Um, and uh, this is also, I think, important to the council member because we've seen that Whenever you know recycling, um, when the Bloomberg administration suspended plastics and glass recycling, the recycling rates never fully rebounded from that. So we've seen time and again how if you temporarily suspend uh, collection or you slow down our progress um, in recycling or uh, any other environmental issue, you've seen you see years of setback. And at a time when um, the city uh, is, is moving toward zero waste, is moving toward, you know, this council is focused a lot on climate issues um, and we don't wanna lose sight of that. So um, we're, we're looking forward to getting a hearing scheduled on the bills. Um, we have a lot of support right now. So we have uh, 13 uh, council members on our um, bill so far, uh, including actually the Manhattan Borough President who is very supportive. And we have a number of advocates that have kind of formed this composting uh, coalition, um, New York Lawyers for the Public Interest, the Environmental Justice Alliance, uh, Natural Resources Defense Council, um, all of the solid waste advisory boards in the city or swabs. Um, and then uh, a bunch of the groups that are currently being funded through the community compost project. So, um, groups like Lower East Side Ecology Center um, and others that um, you may all know through uh, your work. Uh, so I can, that, that's kind of the broad um, sweep uh, summary of the bill, but uh, we're excited to fight for this. And um, I think you all know how much these issues matter to people in our district. So we wanna fight to ensure that there is some funding um, so that we can maintain a composting program in the city. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Abigail. Um, does anyone have questions about the legislation, about the bills? I'm looking for the raised hand function. It's in your uh, participants 
I don't see anybody with a raised hand. No, I, I see it. I just don't see anybody with a raised hand is what I'm saying. Does anybody have, uh, do you see anyone with a raised hand, Luke? I don't see that. Nope. No questions at all? Okay, I'll start out with one. Our, in our district, um, I guess you said the locations have not yet been selected and DSNY would be the driver of that. Are there, are there, is there anything proposed on locations or it's all very loosey-goosey at this point? That hasn't been selected yet. Um, I think we're, we're still right now, because our bill requires that the sites be operational by June 1st, 2021, we still have to fight for the funding for this year to maintain um, the sites for the next year. But um, uh, I think uh, sanitation, and I, and I do think it's important um, to stand up for a kind of equitable um, spacing, because in some districts, there's just not availability for drop-off sites or for um, electronics recycling, that kind of thing. So I think a sanitation would have to work with the different groups. And we don't go into right now, and we may um, amend it after the hearing. Usually the bills are amended, but it doesn't go too much into the process for selection of who would run the sites. So right now, seven groups are funded by the Community Compost Project, um, which include the four botanical botanical gardens. So I think I pr presumably a lot of those same groups would run these sites just because they have the infrastructure in place and they have, you know, decades of experience in this. Um, but it's a question of where the those sites would actually be in some of the in some of the areas that don't already have a lot of access. Gotcha. Joe Mafia, you had a question. You're, you're muted, Joe. Still muted. Joe, we still can't hear you. Um, I'm going to go in the interim. I'm going to go to July. Can you hear me now? Oh, sorry, one second. Okay, go ahead, Joe. All right, I didn't turn my mic on. Um, Abigail, what is the cost of the of this program? Yeah, so that's one thing that, and we actually are talking to Department of Sanitation soon about the bill because we haven't gotten a chance and they're, I mean, you know, they, they don't want to see all these cuts either. So I think it's hard for uh, them because they're they're running these programs and they believe in the, the programs too. Um, but obviously, so the, the voluntary curbside program which I mentioned is $21.5 million. That's, the, that's a huge amount of the money um, that we were spending on composting. And that program, by the way, um, the, the major fight in the city was actually to, before this, was to um, have a mandatory uh, curbside program, just because right now um, the program only diverts 1.5% of the city's compost material. Well, if you, um, if you make it mandatory, you double the spending, but divert potentially 20 times the material based on mirroring collection of plastics. So um, already that was an imperfect program and we really wanna reach um, mandatory a program that would allow for a lot more collection. So it's a lot more cost effective too. Um, but the community compost project, which is basically the same kind of drop off site idea was 3.5 million. Ours also includes outreach and education, which before was 2.5 million. So I would guess that it's it's somewhere around that range, but we'd have to, because we're adding in other streams of um, requiring the sites to collect electronics and potentially hazardous waste, we have to see what the administration says on that. Um, it might be that those are collected at some of the sites rather than all of the sites, but that does add some extra cost. Um, but that's my, that's kind of an estimate for you. Thank you. Thank you, Abigail. July, you had a question? Thank you, Renee. Um, yes, Joe asked one of my questions. So thank you, Joe. My second question was uh, to Abigail, can you clarify when you say this bill, if goes through, would be effective June 1, 2021, and meanwhile, we would still have to fight for funding for composting for the current year. What do you mean by that? Sure, so the way that uh, Council Member Reynoso, who is um, also the chair of the sanitation committee in the council, so it's good that uh, uh, he is part of this package. Um, 
he talks about it as like a short-term, medium-term, and long-term solution. So uh, the way he talks about it is the short-term, we have to we have to continue to fight for funding for some of the compost initiatives in this budget. Um, so whether that's, you know, the obviously the advocates and we are fighting for that um, community compost initiative that's already in place to be fully funded. Uh, it's unclear, maybe, maybe it'll be cut, but either way, if we pass this bill, this is also kind of a negotiating leverage for us that we have all the support for the bill. Um, that's why it was important we introduce it now but uh, certainly uh, this is kind of the medium term solution. So uh, next year, making sure that we keep this program in place if we continue to have you know, cuts. Um, so this is kind of the medium term. The long term is what I talked about with the mandatory program, um, which would be, you know, I think we've been set back um, just because uh, we're facing all these cuts and it's important that we balance all of our priorities. Obviously we have a lot of other social services and other things that we wanna preserve, but uh, we do want some form of this program to stay in place so that we are still on track to meet our goals. Thank you. So just to clarify, <laughs> sorry, I just wanna clarify. So meanwhile, we're fighting for the 21.5 million for fiscal 2021? So, I mean, obviously um, some people are fighting for that composting, the curbside program. We're mm -hmm. fighting for the uh, community compost project, which is the drop-off sites. That's $3.5 million, yes. which is the 175 drop-off sites. Thank you. Yep. Mary, I saw you had your hand up. Um, yeah, thanks, Renee. Um, I think you maybe had just answered this, Abigail, but um, I have the luxury of just using the Union Square drop-off site, which is manned by Lower East Side Ecology. And it's wonderful, there are people always there, but when you say that these new sites would be manned at least 20 hours, does that mean that those would also only be the drop-off hours for people? In other words, is it sort of like a part-time situation? Yeah, so I've actually talked with them and others about this because they've brought up that, you know, we want to make sure that the the 20 hour part of this was put in really just to ensure that these are not open for like a few hours a week or something um, and that they actually have staff, uh, especially if we are requiring electronics and other streams to be collected. But um, I, what's been brought up by Lower East Side Ecology Project and others is, you know, they there are a lot of sites in the city that aren't staffed or that people can drop off at other times. So it's possible in our amendments or in the hearing, we'll talk about how that will work. Cause I think we wanted to get this out there so that we could fight for the funding and the program most of all. Um, but I think in terms of the staffing, you know, it's possible that some sites would not be staffed and would just collect compost. Others might require staff more full time. So I think we still have to kind of look into that. This was meant as more of a minimum, I think. Thank you so much, Abigail. I think Rachel, you have a question. You're muted, Rachel. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Good. Yeah. Um, so kind of related to the last question, just wondering what the current balance is between like private groups that do the collection and the city. So like the Lower East Side is an example of one of those groups. Um, I just remember having a presentation at some point from more of like the, the private group perspective. Yeah, so I know that right now, uh, I mean, obviously the, the curbside program would be collected by the city, but right now the drop-off locations are run in partnership with different groups uh, with Department of Sanitation running the entire program. So I believe the, the groups funded right now for that and the outreach and education part of it is through Grow NYC. So that they're also facing cuts. I didn't know that they've probably presented to you all. Um, the seven groups funded by Community Compost Project are Snug Harbor on Staten Island, Lower East Side Ecology Center, Earth Matter on Governor's Island, and then the four botanical gardens. So um, they are, they're the ones that have been running these um, drop-off sites. And then there's some like community gardens um, that they are partner with as well. Thank you. Are there any more questions? from the committee. Okay, 
I'm gonna to move to the attendees to see if any of the attendees have any questions about the proposed legislation. Luke, I don't see any hands raised in the attendees, but I wanna make sure. Do you see? Nope, and just a note to attendees, you can find the hand raise button if you click participants on the bottom of your Zoom window. In that participants list, you'll see a button on the lower right hand side that says raise hand. Okay, any, any more questions from the committee and or attendees? Seeing none, I'm gonna to move to business session on, on the part of the committee for this particular core um, legislation, these two bills. Um, does anyone wanna kick off the discussion? You've heard what is being proposed. Um, there's, it, you know, um, I think that like everything nowadays, um, there's a lot of uncertainty around the details um, given the budget constraints. Who, would like to kick off the discussion about this issue. Anybody? All right, I don't see anybody. I will take it. Um, I, I personally am very much in favor of this bill. I think as Abigail said, recycling, you know, it's sort of one step forward, two steps back. And it's really, really important to, um, you know, keep the green movement, if you will, going in the city. Um, it doesn't seem like this bill um, is particularly expensive as of now, as presented, just to um, keep the sites going. Um, and to that extent, I'm very much in favor, but I'd like to hear what the rest of the committee has to say about the issue. Renee, do you see those hands raised? Uh, yep, I'll go with Zach. Zach is a new member to the committee. Welcome, Zach. Thank you. Thanks, Renee. Uh, I just had a, it's a clarification question. Um, so I saw the email you sent across uh, earlier today. And so, so if I just want to make sure I understand correctly, the list of cuts proposed, there's like seven different items. Um, and the councilman's bill propo is, proposes to eliminate one of those cuts, which, which is a 3.5 million for the elimination or for the one-year reduction funding for the New York City Compost Project. Is that right? I believe that's correct. Abigail, what he's referring to is I sent over the DSNY um, their, their summary of where their budget cuts were, where they were looking to make budget cuts. So I'm going to say yes, but I'm saying that with the caveat that I, I don't want to commit myself to that absolutely. But that's, that's my reading of it too. If I can uh, also interject one thing. Um, so it, it is the basically the community compost project, but we want to preserve the outreach and education part of it too, which right now is through Grow NYC. So that's 2.5 million. So that's why I kind of estimated uh, 6 million for you all. But again, we're adding in a few other streams of the electronics and um, safe disposal. Um, okay. Um, I'm sort of undercutting with one more clarification, if I may. You indicated that the state, uh, that we are mandated by state law to have this electronics collection. Is there is there any litigation pending on the issue that would force? Uh, not that I know of right now. I know that for electronics, um, the state statute says you obviously have to properly dispose of them. And there are options sometimes of bringing them to like Best Buy or electronic stores. Obviously that isn't really open right now. so. There really is no mechanism. Um, so we do want to preserve. Uh, that's why the, it's important to have that part of it in there. Um, and then the safe disposal events. Um, also, there's no way for people to dispose of hazardous materials if they don't have any type of drop off for that. Great. Thank you, Abigail. Joseph. Hi, uh, I just wanted to say that uh, I also strongly support the legislation. It seems like it was well thought out. Um, I, it really uh, stuck with me what you said, uh, Abigail, about habits, you know, stuff like this, you know, recycling, composting, you know, it's kind of hard to build a habit to do something new, I think, for a lot of people, including me. Um, so yeah, I think it could do a lot of harm to go even a year or two without any options for composting because 
it erases a lot of progress. Um, I think also this this recognizes that we have budget cuts, but you know, coronavirus is a crisis. Climate change is still, you know, an equally big crisis, um, and we can't just throw it all out because um, we have to cut across the board. I mean, it's a longer, you know, the crisis is kind of moving along in a less noticeable way uh, than coronavirus, but you know, we still have to pay attention to it. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, July. Thank you. Um, two thoughts here. Uh, one is the applicab applicability for CB5. I'm just thinking, you know, we're the Central Business District of Manhattan. It, in terms of composting, it probably does not apply to our district as much as, say, parts of Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and the Bronx, and other parts of Manhattan. Uh, but I, I agree this is a good bill on, on philosophy. Um, and, and another thought is that it's unclear to me whether or not the Department of Sanitation will need to reduce the number of employees because of the loss of funding, or are they simply going to reassign the people who are picking up the compost to other roles um, to just maintain the number of you know, jobs and headcounts. If that's the case, then we're just creating another budget line for a city that already is going to have a deficit. And I was in a nonprofit world for um, six years. My experience is that usually when you add funding to nonprofits, um, it's, hard to, it's hard to take it back because that goes with capacity building, that goes with staff hiring. Um, so those are my thoughts. Um, just to clarify, July, are, overall, are you in favor of the bills or um, you are in favor with these caveats or these thoughts or? Um, yeah, I would be in favor of the bill if we can clarify you know, what happens with the uh, budget reduction with the sanit sanitation department, because um, I think that's the prudent thing to do. So you're saying to shift away from the people who were formerly collecting? Yeah. I think, I think that that's an interesting um, way to think about it. I don't know that the bill goes so far as to designate. Um, and again, Abigail, maybe you could clarify. I know that we're sort of undercutting ourselves, but is there um, a clarification as to, you know, um, was there any thought to the Department of Sanitation taking back from those entities that work? Uh, like I said, the bill doesn't go into who would staff the sites, but uh, I, th I think, I mean, presumably the San Department of Sanitation would again partner with uh, these different groups that have run the sites. So they they run and staff the sites, not, uh, I don't believe not Department of Sanitation workers, although I'm sure they're involved in the uh, carting of the materials. Um, but yeah, I, I, I mean, they're facing cuts already, I'm sure, in staff for the voluntary curbside program that, that uh, uh, will be cut is proposed to be cut. Thank you. Any other thoughts by the committee members on this legislative proposed legislation? Joe, any any more thoughts or Kim, any ideas? I, I'm in favor in favor of it. I wish it would go further, frankly, because this is such a, an important long term uh, concept. But certainly, I would be I would be supportive of it. Kim, Kim? any ideas? Agree also in support. Um, obviously, it's not something that we want to stop entirely, as several other committee members have mentioned. And just considering, of course, budget cuts, I think this kind of, you know, does a good job of taking that into consideration and is a good option for us. Okay, Rachel, I saw you had your hand raised. Yeah, sorry, I don't know if I'm still supposed to raise my hand. Um, also in favor, I think, obviously for the environmental reasons and the habitual reasons that were cited, but also if it is a mandatory or you know, a mandate from the state, I think that we need to 
still be providing a way to meet that. Okay. Any more comments from the committee? Any more discussion? Anybody want to add anything to the conversation? I'm not seeing any raised hands. I'm hearing, I'm hearing that for the most part, we're very much in favor of the resolution uh, of supporting the, the two bills and that we would like to support it with the resolution. I think that's what I'm hearing. Do I hear um, a motion regarding a resolution? So moved. Okay, thank you, Sam. Um, and do I, so if we were talking about the resolution, we would support both bills um, recognizing that we hope that perhaps the Department of Sanitation doesn't incur any loss of jobs as a result of this directly, um, but that generally we're in favor of this. We think it's really important and we recognize the mandate from the state to actually continue at least the electronics collection and hazardous waste program. Um, we're interested in the equitable distribution sites and support the program. Um, do I hear a second? Do I? Second. Thank you, Kim. All right, we'll take it to a vote. Okay. Renee? Yes, I, one second. Does anyone have any conflict with this vote? Okay, seeing none, we'll take it to a vote. Yes, in favor. I'm a yes. Zach? Yes. Mary? Yes. Joseph? Yes. Laura? Yes. Tristan? Uh, yes. Robert. Yes. Rob. Yes. Sam. Yes. Jennifer. Yes. Jamie. Yes. Lucas. Yes. Joe. Yes. Kim. Yes. Evan. Yes. Chuck. He's on yet. Pete. Yes. Rachel. Yes. And July. Yes. Okay. Great. It looks like we have an anonymous vote. And just to reiterate for the new members, the way this works is that our resolution, I will pen the resolution. Um, I sign this one to myself. It will be presented at the full board meeting. The full board will vote, and that will be the position of CBI. Abigail, thank you so very much. Really, really yeah, thank you. Thank you for the resolution. Thank you so much. Um, we're going to move to the second part of the meeting today, which is, is a little bit different than normal. Um, it's a little bit more free flowing, and it's really about the situation that um, we're all facing here in the city. And it's an opportunity to talk about all the issues that we've seen, what we would like the city to look like post COVID, any challenges that we see. Um, it's more of a, a free flowing conversation than any sort of resolution um, presentation. So um, as I said in my email, I, I hope you all have ideas and challenges and questions. And um, we're gonna take this information. Most of the committees in CB5 are having this conversation and we'll be able to consolidate um, the conversations and the ideas to see ways in which we can imagine the city moving forward and working with different partners to try and make that happen. So who would like to kick off the conversation? I don't know, Vicki, do you wanna to speak to this at all? Would you like to say a few words at all? Sorry, I didn't mean to put you on the screen. Sorry, that's okay. No, really, we're asking every committee to weigh in on all of the um, thoughts, uh, questions, ideas, whatever's going through your mind in terms of each uh, committee's specific responsibilities. So Bex will be looking at it from obviously the budget, the education part of it, and the city services. If you have questions as to how it's going to continue, what's going to happen while it continues, what'll happen post COVID and how that, you might have questions on how that will impact uh, when this finally goes into the, you know, the final phases. So we're looking for a very um, lively discussion with uh, 
not necessarily answers right off the bat because this is the first discussion we're having uh, this month, all the committees, but what are you thinking? What are the things you're concerned about? What are the topics that you feel are going to be affected or be changed, maybe for the better, maybe not? You must have a lot of different things going on you know, in your mind in terms of how this is going to affect our city in relation to the things that this committee deals with. Thank so everybody you. jump in. <laughs> Thank you. Let me see if I see any of the hands raised for kicking it off. I know that, I know um, Mary, you and I talked, um, I don't mean to put you on the spot either, but I know that you had an issue that was uh, um, of concern and something that Bex deals with regularly. Um, would you mind sharing? Sure, I'll jump in. Um, I was listening to the most recent general welfare committee testimony and you know, Steve Banks is obviously very smart and trying to get ahead of the curve. Um, worry about when the um, moratorium on evictions is lifted and the city will definitely need more money for rental assistance to help people stave off eviction given the massive job loss that the city is experiencing. Um, in the more immediate uh, front, you know, I live in Union Square and there's a lot of anticipatory press about closing the subways at night and cleaning them and the need to get homeless people off. And initially the mayor was touting that hundreds of people have taken the helping hand and have come in to shelter. It turns out that something like only 103 out of 3,000 people have actually accepted services and remained in shelter. And more troubling were the images out of Bellevue Men's Shelter, which is on 30th Street and First Avenue. It's the central intake point for men. And you just saw dozens and dozens of men sleeping inches apart on the floor, um, completely mismanaged. And, you know, Danny Drum and um, Steve Levin are the co-chairs of the General Welfare Committee. Um, either them or um, Corey Johnson, any of them I think would be excellent partners to get a handle. I, I don't even know what's going on at Brooklyn Women's Shelter, but it just seems to me that the city has been very obstinate saying that they're not going to take people directly off the street and put them into um, places where they can be spaced to protect their health. And I, I, that's a real concern to me because let's face it, my bottom line was that there are just more and more people on the streets surrounding my house. I'm sure other people are seeing things throughout their neighborhoods as well. Thank you. Do, does anybody have anything to add to Mary's commentary on these issues? Anyone in our attendees? I'm looking at the hands. I do. Jen, uh, Joe. Um, I think uh, our, well, our, certainly our district is going to be impacted by Broadway theaters um, and the uncertainty of when they're gonna reopen. Um, a good chunk of my client base is in entertainment and is, is impacted by this. Um, same with restaurants in our district and, uh, and real estate. And um, we, my firm has a lot of real estate clients and uh, they, they, you know, it, it seems that they are the ones that uh, are supposed to fund a lot of these losses or um, people are viewing it as, well, the landlord should really bear the, you know, bear this. I don't have to pay him rent. I don't, I, you know, I, um, so I have mixed feelings. And at the same time, you know, the COVID unemployment $600 is gonna run out on June 30th. Um, a lot of these industries will not be back by, there's no way they'll be back by June 30th, Broadway, right now it says September, but most people think it's gonna be much longer. Um, and even when it does come back, what, it will, what will it look like? And will it be a profitable venture um, to put on a, a Broadway production? It's risky at best now. And as you can imagine, if there's a limit on, the, on seating, how will that impact pricing and how will that impact um, profitability? Um, so, you know, I, I have clients that are um, that are booming. 
I have a cleaning company that is everyone wants their buildings cleaned in uh, um, you know, supersized industrial cleaning. Uh, so I'm seeing things very uneven. I, I think the legal profession, accounting firms, um, right now they there, you know, I have 170 people have nothing to do but work. So we're trying to make the, uh, um, the tax deadline of July 15th, but um, it, it's gonna be such uneven. And, and then I think after June 30th, if a lot of industries are, are out, I, I, I'm hearing, you know, radio reports, news reports that crime is going to pick up. Um, so I think crime in our district will, um, you know, will continue to be an issue. Um, so I, I have no answers. I just have, um, you know, a, a mixed concern. And it's clearly things are picking up. If I, you know, I walk, I go to the office twice a week. It's seven blocks from my house and construction has started. It started a few weeks ago. Um, uh, and I saw an outdoor cafe. They, I guess they were just serving drinks and, and what have you. But on like 54th and Madison, uh, um, they had tables set up outside. Um, tourism is the other industry that I think, um, you know, is, uh, will, will just get Batter. So I, I think I, I am concerned about long-term economic impact to our district and how that will um, how that will play out on the budget. Thank you. You brought out a, a lot of issues. I think everybody, you know, many people are concerned about, and it's great. That's exactly what we want to hear: is all of these issues that are impacting um, the district. I'm going to go with Jen Kasner. She has her hand up. Jen. Thanks. Um, yeah, I mean, I think echoing a bunch of the things that were said, I also live in Union Square, and I think that something I think needs to be done to help people um, facing homelessness and also to make sure that, you know, the streets are also safe, um, especially from a COVID perspective. Um, and then I also think on the, the rent perspective, you know, not just the eviction, you know, moratorium, but what happens when people can't pay their rents? Is there anything that's happening to help protect people? Um, because I've also seen, you know, some predatory things, even on the part of landlords, like we're moving and our landlord charged us erroneously, but like one and a half times our rent um, from an accounting error. And like, I just wonder how much that's happening across the city and how people are gonna be able to pay their rent um, even if they can't be evicted. And then what happens to your finances if people, if landlords are charging exorbitant amounts. Um, and then also I think on the, the crime front, like making sure that the city is safe, especially as people you know, need to be protected and are having a lot of different financial issues. Thank you, Jen. All very good points. Um, Robert, I'm going to, Rob, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Sorry. Just uh, dealing with little ones. Um, so, you know, I, I, I've been sort of listening to everyone and, and I think that my main concern and what I keep hearing a lot about, and I think you guys know I'm in the real estate world generally is you know, kind of the balancing act of the accounts of everything um, for the city, for landlords, for individuals, renting, owning, whatever it may be, and suffering job losses or income losses. Um, it's not quite clear to me that the current set of public policies really encompasses the value chain of, you know, who pays who and where that money goes and kind of how the city derives a lot of its budget. Um, I think it's 50% of the budget is from property taxes. I could be wrong about the exact number, but the order of magnitude, I think is pretty close to that. And, you know, at some point, my concern is if the tenant concern is important, obviously, but if it's too strong, at some point, the city starts to get into a position where, you know, we could be back in kind of the trap of the 70s where building owners start to say, you know, hey, this is this is becoming unprofitable. Uh, what do we do here? Uh, I, I've actually seen it degrade over two months in a couple buildings that I work with. 
you know, to a point where buildings are now essentially losing money. Um, and I don't know how much longer that can go on. And in some cases, the banks have been willing to, uh, you know, have been willing to provide, you know, deferments or forbearance, but I'm not hearing a ton of conversation about how that gets funded across the whole value chain from, you know, the individual who can't pay their rent to the owner who's having trouble paying either the bank or in some cases, maybe even the city, uh, you know, to the, the bank that's not getting its mortgage payments. I mean, at some point, maybe it all rolls up to the feds, but the feds are questionable cooperation at the moment. And everything seems focused on the individual, which I think is the right approach right now, but I don't know that it's the right approach over the next 12 months. I think it's gotta be a little more holistic than that. And I haven't been hearing that conversation. And it really concerns me in terms of how New York City funds itself and you know, how we pay for all the, the programs that we believe are the right ones, including you know, the, the ones we just voted on. So I have no answers at all, um, but definitely very concerned about kind of the fiscal side of things and, and how that all works out from a real estate and property tax perspective. No, I think you make a really important, a really important point there, Rob. Seriously, um, I've been thinking about the same things. I'm going to call on Zach now, who has his hand raised. Thanks, Renee. Um, so I think I, you know, agree with both Mary and Robert, who I think both made interesting points. I live in Union Square on 15th Street, and you know, I've, I think you know the issue of homelessness and drug addiction has become even more present over the last three months as people have fled the city. Those with nowhere to go, um, you know, I guess no, have, they have no home, have you know become more. You know, it's more obvious that they're out on the streets. Um, on the other hand, you know, you can't just cancel rent. Uh, there's a pretty significant trickle down effect. To, you know, landlords then can't pay banks, um, and banks can't pay deposit holders, and it's you know it's not government just can't pay rent for everybody. Um, and then if and so it's a it's really and I, there's not a there's not a solution. It's really going to be incredibly hard to thread the needle between you know providing for people that. Um, are going to get evicted uh, and increase the issue of homelessness and drug addiction. Um, and also, you know, what to do for, you know, to allow people to, you know, and then trying to prevent that from happening. So I don't know how it's, I don't know how it's dealt with neighborhood or city by city, state by state, but um, it's an incredibly complex issue that I, you know, I don't have answers for, but it's, um, I think it'll be the, you know, the, one of the biggest issues for the next five years, not only for New York, but for every really probably most major metropolitan areas. Yeah, I agree. Thank you, Zach. I'm gonna call on Joseph. I see his hand is raised. Yeah, thanks. Um, I, uh, I guess a, a lot of people are bringing up homelessness. Um, so I guess I have a couple things I wanted to add, but the only thing I wanted to add to the homelessness conversation is that, um, you know, I, I work for a homeless services nonprofit. And so, you know, we've, been experiencing the city's um, mandate that we move all um, adults from our congregate shelters into hotels. Um, and it's a very uh, rushed process. Um, it's not a very democratic process. Uh, you know, the nonprofit isn't involved in the decision about which hotel to go to, um, any characteristics of it. Um, how close it is to the shelter that's being moved into the hotel. There's just a, or the timing even, you know, we, we were given a, a week and a half's notice and we had to fight really hard to get that week and a half, which is still not enough time to do a smooth transition of a hundred, you know, chronically homeless men uh, from the Bronx to a hotel on the Upper West Side. Um, so I guess that, that worries me because that's going to continue to happen over the next weeks and months. And, you know, what we've seen over the last few years is the city's relied on hotels to make up this gap in shelter capacity is that the people living in hotels don't get good services. Um, you know, definitely there are nonprofits who have made efforts to, to do that and to do outreach. Um, but, you know, it's, it's often a way for the city to just kind of, you know, put a bandaid over the problem of, you know, not enough safely run, you know, shelters, safe havens, drop-in centers. Um, so I, I worry that we're going to lose progress in moving all of these moving all of these staff and clients into these hotel settings. And um, I hope there's gonna be ways to ensure that, you know, the providers running these programs are, you know, able to do good work or funded to do good work in this new environment. 
um, you know, are held accountable um, for doing all of the same outreach and engagement uh, with clients and hotel rooms that they were doing in congregate settings. Cause I think it's easy for people to get kind of lost if you're in a hotel room and you can just shut the door and not let your social worker in. Um, so that's, that's something that I've thought about. I don't have a great solution. It's just on my mind. Um, and then I think um, another kind of big topic that, that has come to mind is all of these concerns that I share about the loss of economic vibrancy and people's loss of income you know, what that would do to the city, to the budget. Um, you know, it, it really is, it's so determined by the course the virus takes, um, the development of a vaccine, um, how our health system deals with it, um, people's behavior. Um, and so many of those things are out of our control, but, you know, one thing that is within our control um, collectively is contact tracing. Um, and I feel like I hear trickles from, you know, the news media, um, about kind of efforts to hire enough people to do adequate contact tracing and how that's going. But I mean, honestly, the only thing that'll get Broadway shows opened again, that'll get people coming back to their offices again, um, people into restaurants and bars again, is confidence that, you know, the virus isn't going to disappear before we get a vaccine, but it would be confidence that there's a really robust contact tracing program that's up and running, doing its job. Um, I know that would make me feel a lot safer once we open up. Um, and all I've heard about it so far, and I haven't done as much research as some of you probably, but all I've heard about it is that, you know, the responsibility was shifted in this erratic way from uh, the um, health department to New York City Health and Hospitals, which seemed very off, um, and that they've been hiring people. But like, uh, I worry about the administration's ability to oversee this and to do a really good job. And it seems incredibly important. So I would just like us to pay attention to that. Thank you. I think you're absolutely spot on um, with that for sure. Layla, your hand is raised. Layla? Sorry, just a second. Okay, Layla, you should be unmuted. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I just wanted to make a you know a, a couple of uh, of comments and share a few thoughts. Um, the, uh, the the first one I would say is that um, Community Board Five is uh, one of the main uh, drivers of New York economy, and um, it is really important that we advocate to um, you know get any. Uh, support uh, both from the city and from the state. So I think that it would be uh, wise that the uh, the BEX committee, you know, if, if we end up putting together some sort of recommendation that really uh, specifically speaks to the budget, that we're really very forceful in, um, you know, saying that we, we should be treated as an absolute priority. The, uh, the second point that I would like to, uh, uh, to share is that, um, the, the federal government is only going to provide, uh, you know, federal funding in, in a form of a bailout and support, uh, you know, th this fiscal term. And I think it's really important that, once again, we are very forceful in advocating that, you know, uh, the federal government provides as much support uh, to New York as uh, as possible. And, you know, as, as much as we know that the mayor is doing that, we know that the governor is doing that. Uh, but I think that we can, uh, you know, support their effort, add uh, or, or comment to, uh, to, to this request. Uh, because in 2021, I don't think that the federal government is going to come to the rescue of New York. Um, the other area where I think we, uh, you know, it would be valuable to be on record is uh, on the issue of hospitals. Over the course of the past 20 years, 20 hospitals have closed in New York City. And uh, this is simply not adequate uh, to deal with pandemics. And we have seen it. Um, and this is something that um, I think we should be on record. Um, although I believe none of these hospitals were in CB5, they were in the uh, vicinity of CB5 and they were you know, certainly serving 
a large uh, swath of our uh, constituents, both residents and uh, you know people who work in the district. Uh, you know, St. Vincent's obviously, and CB2 uh, is, uh, is is a good example. Losing all these hospitals, losing all these beds, and uh, with the, the the current conversation we're having about Beth Israel, uh, which is taking the same route, it, it is simply unwise. And I think it would be valuable that we're on record saying that you know it, it is really bad. Uh, uh, public health policy to reduce the number of beds. Um, and then the final point that I would like to make is uh, to talk about school capacity. Um, we are on record for uh, probably the past 15 years um, asking for an increase in uh, school capacity, especially in elementary schools. Um, the elementary schools that serve our children, which most of them are actually outside of the district, uh, but they are severely overcrowded. And um, as much as it was an education issue, now it is going to become a health issue. And uh, more than ever, uh, we need to reduce the capacity uh, and keep it reduced um, going forward because uh, we know now that it is uh, necessary for uh, health in time of pandemic, but uh, we also know that it is uh, good for uh, education. Uh, so basically, th those are the three uh, themes, uh, you know, budget support from uh, federal funding with federal funding, um, hospital closures, uh, which are really hurting our district and uh, education and school capacity. Those are the three uh, themes that um, I think would be valuable for CB5 to get on record. Leila, thank you so much. Those are all spot on. I, I agree with you on every single on every single point. Um, anybody want to add to Layla's points regarding those issues? Okay, I am gonna um, I'm gonna call on Martin Whelan, and then we'll go back to our. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Martin. Hold on one second. Laura, can I? You, I see you put your hand up. Yes. Um, um, first of all, I'd like to um, thank Layla for um, bringing the issue about. I mean the the topic about hospitals. I am a, um, a nurse and um, I have worked in a hospital um, that was uh, in operation for 125 years and they closed it in 2013. And so I um, actually, um, I, um, I'm strongly, um, I have a strong feelings about that um, of, of the government um, closing hospitals. Anyway, that's um, that's one point that I just wanted to bring out. And I also hear all the um, the issues brought up by by um, the um, participants, um, especially the CB five uh, um, um, uh, folks or people. And um, I have been, since this pandemic, I have been very, um, very uh, um, involved with my uh, organization. And we have um, been um, advocating for issues of common concern, such as um, education, health, immigration, human rights, and many, um, many more. And I hear what um, Joe had mentioned about crimes that may um, may rise after this pandemic. In fact, um, it has been um, a, a concern now um, in terms of, uh, um, of that. I mean, in relation to that, um, most, I'm Asian, we have been uh, um, attacked. Um, I would say in general, the Asian community have, has been attacked um, regarding um, uh, hate crimes and um, xenophobia. So we are fighting for that. Um, I don't know too what, um, what, the, um, what solutions we may have, but um, the governor and then the mayor have been have been vigilant in helping the Asian community. So um, this is uh, my concerns is of course, what's, what's going to happen later after this pandemic. Although this, is, this pandemic may, may go on for, for, for a long, long time. And I just hope 
and um, this will um, uh, the the community, especially the CB five, will help in in the um, in uh, in these and there's um, problems or in, in this issue in with these issues. So um, I'm. I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm a little emotional when it comes to, to these issues. Uh, that's why I prefer sometimes not to say anything, but um, I think uh, I, um, it, it's, this, is, this is the best time for me to, to express them. I'm in a, in a safe, in a safe um, community and in a safe environment. So thank you for allowing me to, to speak my, my thoughts, um, to express my thoughts. And um, I, um, with all these problems later on, I have not really heard um, uh, um, solutions about or, or um, uh, budget in terms of or in relation to mental health because with all the problems that we have mentioned or the issues that we have mentioned are we um do we have any um any uh, uh, well not solutions but are we um also uh is our board um working on um, budgets uh, in terms of so, um, what I can say is part of the budget process is this conversation is going to be distilled so that we can advocate for priorities. I think from the board overall, all of the, as Vicki mentioned, all of the committees will be having the conversation and it will help to distill priorities. I think um, the budget, there's a huge deficit as everyone knows in the budget. So people are looking to prioritize different needs and trying to figure out exactly um, how to operate in this new world. And I think, you know, you're bringing up mental health issues, you're, you're bringing up a bunch of other issues that I think are important and that will be added to the priorities as we think about how to get funding. And then separate from that, of course, the, the community board's budget process is going to go on as normal and we will be dealing with that. Um, I'm gonna send something out to everybody after this meeting, we'll be doing the usual process. The borough consultations will go forward, our budget requests will go forward as normal. That that process hasn't changed. So we do have those two opportunities. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you for your ears. Yeah, no. Um, Julie, I saw you have your hand up. Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit to the homelessness and then touch upon affordable housing. Um, you know, Joseph mentioned that they moved a lot of the people to hotels, but Look, one thing that um, one of our service providers mentioned was moving these um, adult individuals back into congregate shelters and that they probably can't uh, manage as many people as they had before. So um, shelter capacity is gonna be reduced if they're gonna be able to keep social distancing from um, happening in the shelters. Um, the other thing is, I know housing is not um, a priority in our district, but in order to get people off the streets into shelters and um, into housing, I know that um, a lot of our projects, our affordable housing projects have been delayed um, one to two fiscal years. Um, I know the um, projects that were supposed to get financing in June has been pushed back to the end of the year, next year as well. And our clients have been telling us that they're depending on federal stimulus money um, to fund some of our projects. Okay. Thanks, Julie. Um, Kim, can I, do you wanna to add to that? Yes, absolutely. I have all the answers. No. <laughs> I wish. Uh, well, uh, my colleagues have articulate, articulated and um, is such an expertise in the areas of homelessness and and what I had in mind also um, huge concerns I think as we look to open in general there's just so much inequity around the planning um, I wanted to circle back maybe to education in schools when I think about 
the inequity in the homeschooling experience. It's quite overwhelming. Um, access to, of course, the iPads. We know that a lot of children have still been missed with that, uh, as well as broadband access. And um, just making sure as well that parents are able to support with the checks and balance system, um, connecting with tutors. I know we've been doing a lot of work around providing mental health services and or social workers in every school. Um, and then as Layla mentioned as well, that the um, overcrowding and that need for an increase in school seats. So um, there's so much to, I think, think about in that space um, that worries me as we are at risk of kids falling even further behind in their education. Um, I'm just kind of looking through all my topics. On the tracing program, I think some, uh, Joseph raised some very interesting things about this as well and completely agree. Uh, so much around that program, I think there's still a lot to do in order to kind of normalize participation. Um, I think, I know there's a lot of concern around privacy or protection for our undocumented neighbors, things like that. Um, I've been thinking about this summer youth employment program and repurposing of jobs that could be meaningful and perhaps virtual, maybe around food delivery or uh, there's been mention around tech education for seniors, what that look like. When I think about food insecurity, um, we know that there have been tremendous efforts in order to make sure that none of our neighbors are hungry during this time and those will have to continue into the future given the rising unemployment and, um, and economic insecurity. But I know that there is quite a deficit when it comes to providing healthy food. And so I think that's something to consider. Uh, and then, I mean, just even as basic as access to PPE and, uh, you know, as the city looks to reopen, how are we going to make that more accessible for both businesses, small businesses, um, as well as residents? I know there's talk of vending machines. Um, where will they be right now? You know, you can't get a mask at a CVS or a Target, but you can get one at your local bodega, which is fantastic. But how can we um, get PPE into the hands of people that need it? So I think in general, it's just um, a lot of a lot of access and um, consideration of the inequity that could you know, be present in the process of reopening. I agree. Thank you, Kim. Thanks for identifying so many of the challenges and for the the uh, the summer youth program. Those are all good ideas for you know using the kids. Um, you know that we have supported as a board the summer youth program in some way, shape, or form. Um, all right, Sam. I see you've had your hand raised for a while. Yeah, I just um, wanted to. Um, speak a little bit to the need to um, try to stabilize some form of community mental health uh, funding. Um, you know, th this particular situation with the pandemic, I think has just act exacerbated the frailty in the, the mental health support systems. And, you know, and now people are experiencing tremendous amounts of stress and anxiety um, and the capacity uh, to provide services is um, really limited. Um, you know, I think the agencies that are open are doing a great uh, service with tele and video services, um, but um, bottom line, um, there's just not enough. And people, um, I think, are going to have residual symptoms um, from this experience. Um, some even with uh, things bordering on PTSD. So I think it's important just to keep that in mind and to try to make sure there's budget support for that. Thank you. Um, thank you. And I, I think that um, this committee knows that we are very much in support of mental health professionals in the schools for children. And we're reiterating that support with a letter that um, emphasizes uh, the borough president's push for a social worker in every school. And that letter has been going out. Um, 
who else? I see Robert, you have your hand raised again. Yeah, uh, I was just thinking about the the point Layla was making about hospitals, and it's it's something that I've been thinking about as well, um, because there's this this push pull of like, you know, the, there've been I guess if I'm right, maybe four of these something and even close to this since the First World War, or including around the time of the First World War and the Spanish flu, and so I'm kind of having this struggle of well the reasons and the economic realities for the hospital closures um aren't necessarily going to cease existing just because this happened uh and sort of what do we do to counter that how do we it just seems like the the, the public sector is going to need to step in because if you don't then you know okay eventually hopefully things get back to normal there's a vaccine whatever does happen to bring things back to something approaching what we where we were before, you're gonna end up in this place of, okay, well, these realities are back, this sort of drive for efficiency, the funding crunches, whatever was kind of the, the cost of real estate, whatever was kind of driving these problems, these closures, you know, how do we advocate for, uh, you know, for the public sector essentially stepping in to make sure that you know, these things don't happen. And I think some of it is legislation or regulation saying, you know, you have to have a certain number of, you know, facilities or beds or whatever it is per, uh, you know, city block or zip code or whatever it may be. But uh, some of it is also, you know, being voiced to say, look, we need to figure out how to right size the system so that it has the capacity to flex every, hopefully not more than 25 to 30 years, but, you know, is, is aware that this threat is out there and you can't build to, you know, the smallest scale, because every something, you know, 25 years, 30 years, something happens where you get punched in the mouth, and you have to be ready to, to sort of flex and absorb. And, and how does that work? And what do we do to absorb that? So I think you're right. Um, it's certainly, we've heard from Oksana and Beth Israel, who are currently in the process, or were prior to this, of downsizing their very large bed to 70 beds. And hopefully, That'll be something that will be looked at, I think, in the context of the, the pandemic. Um, I'm looking, I'm sorry, one of our attendees, Martin Whelan, you've had your hand up for forever. Um, Martin. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm, a, uh, I'm on the board of the New York Hospitality Alliance and I'm a tenant rep on the board of the 34th Street Partnership. I also own um, six, soon to be seven restaurants in your, um, community board, and I'm also involved in Winter Village at Bryant Park. Um, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are, what the whole board's thoughts are on this open streets that's being thrown around. Whereas we would get to bring our restaurants out onto the streets. Right, I will say um, this, this is the Bex committee and there is a PSQL and a parks and I believe the transportation committee all together tomorrow night at six. Tomorrow night, okay, I apologize. I was unaware of that. Different committee, okay. uh, and I think that that th those issues are going to be discussed. I will say for myself, I, I personally, um, and and as this is a discussion, I I very much in favor of the open streets to allow for the free circulation. My one caveat to that is that there should be a master plan. I think different um, proposals for different streets, and I, I'd love to see that there's some master plan so that there's a way to navigate the streets rather than it being piecemeal. Um, but I think I think it's a great idea for allowing um, businesses to operate and allow people to avoid people on smaller streets. But I'd like to see the rationale for you know one street opening, one street closing, and, and understanding equitably who gets what. Okay, I'm just concerned that the whole process might take too long as the bureaucracy of New York just grinds things. Is there a way I can get on the call tomorrow night? Luke, um, is there a pot? so you may contact our board office CB five. Um, the man behind the screen here who sends out invitations. I think if your um, details are here on the attendee list, Luke will be able to extend that. Luke, am I speaking on a turn? Can you extend that to Mr. Wheeler? Yeah, uh, Martin, I just put my email address in the chat. If you send me an email, um, I will uh, respond with an invite or inviting you uh, to the meeting tomorrow. You put it but in the chat on the side here. I'm sorry, I don't see it. That's okay. Um, I think I do have your email actually like um, 
like Renee was saying. So I'll send you a a, a link to that. Uh, I really the, the appreciate email. it. Okay, guys, thank you very no much. Have a good evening. I ask you, do you have any other um, points that you'd like to share with us as a member of our our, of our district? Well, I, you know, um, I get you know you talked about the individuality. It's does it start at the bottom or does it start at the top? I mean, I'm, I'm you know myself and my partners. I'm, I'm not just one guy owning a bunch of restaurants. Um, I have about twelve partners. We're, we're little guys. We just seem bigger than we are. Uh, you know, we're struggling for our financial life right now, uh, and we get the property tax thing and we get the rent thing. And I, some of my landlords are good and some of them are not so good, but um, I there's going to be some closings. And I'm just fighting for my life. So that's if I can get this open streets thing. It's just one more, you know, thing I can look forward to, hopefully. But I spend my days doing charts for my landlords to show them how we cannot make money at 50% if that's phase one, 50% opening. It's just, we just can't make money. And I have is to show them all my costs and everything. Is there a threshold at which, you know, it becomes- 70% is a number being thrown around. But if we get 50% inside and we're allowed to do some stuff on the streets, you know, hopefully we can get there. And have you been doing takeout during all this? Is that a viable, has that been? Not, it, it, it's not a, it's not a, it's not feasible in Midtown for the most part. I mean, I'm even doing it. At, I have a place in Fidei and I think we're going to cut it out. It does work in neighborhoods. It does work in neighborhoods. But I also think if we do open streets, It'll help the street conditions. I mean, as long as you have, a, if you have a good operator, my record speaks for itself. I mean, you guys have given me numerous licenses. So um, I think it'll help the streets. It'll help bring people back. If, I mean, anybody who's been to Europe and sees street life there as opposed to New York, because of, we have so many people on the streets, that's why we don't do it. But now we don't have so many people on the streets. So why not do it until it, it's not feasible to do anymore? Right. It's just one thing that might help us all come back. And, and it, you know, again, it's taxes. It's, it's money in the, in the city coffers. I mean, they need the money. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Thank you again. And I'm sorry Martin, for the meeting. Thanks again, Martin, Zach. Martin, one thing to uh, we wanted to make the note of right. is yeah. you can find the meeting information on our website, cb5.org, our calendar tab. Okay. Um, cb5.org. Thanks. Thank you again. Take care. Bye-bye. Um, any other committee members or panelists that are that have issues that they would like to share? I mean, I will say for myself, I think um, open streets is a fabulous idea. I would say though, I, I like the idea of a master plan as Layla always says in, in Landmark so that that's all coordinated. I'm really interested in the, the transit hubs. I think there are a lot of um, homeless people and people used to gather around the transit hubs and it'll be interesting to see or understand what happens if they are no longer in use, right? If Penn Station is not bustling, if Times Square is not bustling, um, can we offer some of the services like um, Doctors Without Borders were offering showers to homeless people, there are were, porter were potties, there are hand washing stations. Can some of those ideas remain after you know, um, COVID passes, if it passes, when it passes. Um, broadband, I think free broadband is, a, is, is something we should all get behind as an equitable issue for all the students out there. But I think one of the main things for me is that we should um, take a really strong stand that we should be good stewards of the money that is currently in the budget. When we look at, I, I was looking today at some of the, um, some of the media reports, we spent 21 million on a no bid hospital that wasn't used. We paid over retail for iPads for the students. Um, the, I, I read that article today about getting the, the, the hotel beds is being outsourced to a, to a um, organization in Texas where they get sort of $64 a day. I mean, it's one thing to ask for federal dollars, and I think we should absolutely be doing that, but I also think we, somebody needs to be managing and being a good steward of the money that we currently have to make sure that it's being really spent in, in the most parsonious, parsimonious way. Um, what else? Robert, I see your hand is raised. 
Yeah, just thinking about open streets and, and something I live, as it sounds like a number of other folks do, uh, down near Union Square. Um, and, you know, walking around just trying to get constitutionals in during all this, you know, it really strikes me how need, there needs to be like a holistic view taken, a master plan view on, you know, what the streets should look like kind of during this moment and then what they should look like after. Um, and how do you kind of manage those phase shift phase shifts? Because, you know, if you're gonna have bars spilling and restaurants spilling, really more restaurants, but restaurants spilling into streets, which I generally think is a good idea and it's something that could make life nicer for, for everyone involved. Um, you know, then there's less sidewalk space. If there's less sidewalk space, then, you know, people are gonna be walking in the streets. Maybe that means we have to eliminate uh, or restrict parking more more stringently. I keep a car in the city, but you know maybe that's a sacrifice that you know people, including me, will have to make so that we can have kind of livable pedestrian uh, life for for a period of time. And you know some people are going to have to sacrifice on that front. And it, I, I'm not hearing those conversations. Maybe they're happening, but you know I, maybe DOT should 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 be talking more about it. But you know, for a period of time that's not going to be insignificant, we're going to need to figure out a way to kind of adapt our streets to this. And also, are, you know, are more people going to be keeping cars in the city? Are more people going to be driving in and out of the city because of concerns about public transportation? And what do we do about that? Um, and do we restrict it? Because those of us who, who live here, you know, that, that may be a bad thing for us. So I'd like to hear more. And, and I hope that that thinking is happening and I'm just not seeing it, but it's something I'm concerned about as well. Thank you. I, I absolutely um, agree with you. Joseph, your hand. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, you, you uh, actually, I just wanted to go back to um, something that I think it was Mr. Uh, Whelan uh, had said. Um, I mean, when we're talking about um, open streets and, and letting people sit outdoors, I mean, I think what he said is, is really compelling that, you know, and I think a lot of people are probably in the same situation as he is where maybe every week is another week that it's really difficult to stay in business. So I, I would be worried too, if I were in that situation about a master plan process taking two months, um, three months. I mean, obviously something like that, something like that in New York would usually take years, but you know, even an expedited master plan process, say it takes a month or two, um, you know, with how slow federal and city and state aid is coming to businesses in a lot of cases, you know, this is probably more of a conversation for tomorrow, but I would, I'd want us to think about a way to like fast track something, right? Like get, get something approved with a caveat that, you know, as we develop the master plan, you know, the city or the community in, in consultation with the community boards has a right to kind of refine it and kind of change the rules as we go along. But I wouldn't want us to hold off on letting business owners use space that's available in a safe way soon. Right, point taken. I think that's, I think you're probably right. I, I, I don't disagree with that. Um, who else? Renee? Oh, Kim, Kim. Sorry, Vicky, go ahead. Yep. Uh, I just wanna say, because there's so much interest uh, on this subject of open streets, I really encourage those of you who have such an interest like Robert and Joseph and a couple of others, tune in tomorrow night and please have your voices and your questions heard. It's really important. Um, as Renee mentioned, it's gonna be a meeting of three different committees because they're all involved in some way. Public safety, quality of life because of the whole issue with liquor licenses and people drinking on the streets and in the sidewalk. Uh, Parks and public spaces because of our plazas, our sidewalks, and our public spaces, and then of course T and E because of our streets in particular. So that's going to be a very, very interesting conversation with a lot of points, some of which you've already brought up. And I really encourage people to tune in, attend, and have your voices and your questions heard. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Kim, did I see your hand up as well? It was. I have a lot to say around street seats, but I'll save it for tomorrow night. Okay. No, you're all on the edge of your seats, but. <laughs> okay. Who else have we, haven't we heard from or who else would like to add to the conversation? I think, I think one of the things we haven't really talked about is the small businesses in our, in our district. You've heard about, you know, 
the nail salons, the, the you know, beauty parlors, all of that. Like we are a commercial district and there needs to be, I mean, I don't have any answers, but just the thought of supporting not just restaurants and, and bars, although we need to support them, but you know, the nail salons, the, you know, I don't know, the, the, the copy machine place, the picture framer, um, how do we support them? I don't, I don't really know, but they're the lifeblood of this district. And I think um, a lot of thought has to be given to them. Who else has their hand up? I see somebody, one moment. I'm not seeing, I see that I have a hand raised, but I can't, oh, Scott, Scott Mintz. Scott? Scott, if you unmute your microphone, we'll be able to hear you now. Okay, thank you for letting me know that. Um, I, I know it was mentioned about real estate taxes and as um, an owner in CB5, as well as a board member in CB5, one of the questions I had is about the risk of rising real estate taxes to help fund um, budget deficits in New York City. And, um, you know, while that's happening, I think uh, most people will certainly agree in the short run, property valuations may come down. So we may be getting um, kind of like double whammied with rising real estate taxes and falling real estate prices. I was wondering if there's any actions like to help stay ahead of the curve on this. If there's any actions with the weight of Manhattan and CB5 to help push for perhaps legislative changes, even on a, a federal level to help repeal maybe the salt caps or anything that we can do to help stay ahead of this curve where we may find um, tenant, you know, ship, you know, owners, commercial and or residential who can afford to pay rising real estate taxes, then potentially pushing out those who cannot. Right. I think, I think that's very similar to the issues that Rob raised um, and certainly bringing it to attention here within this committee as we, as we sort of consolidate all of the ideas and the things that are important to us. I mean, we're hearing this issue of property issues. Joe has mentioned it, Rob has mentioned it, you have mentioned it again, uh, you know, across the different, the different entities, not just the renters, but the owners and then property taxes and banks. Um, I think it's a good point. And I think one that we should, you know, pursue as we, as we push forward on the issues that we're concerned about. Okay, thank you. Who else would like to um, add to the conversation? Anyone else have any more comments? July, anything? Um, thanks, Renee, for calling on me. Um, no, I agree with uh, a lot of what everybody had to say. Um, if anything, I would add uh, one other factor in terms of safety, especially, uh, you know, safety for uh, single women. I don't know about the other board colleagues, female colleagues, but I no longer go outside after 5.30 uh, I, since beginning of April. I just, I no longer feel safe and I am three, four blocks away from Penn Station area. Um, and I know the police body, you know, they've got a tough job. Um, the homeless population, uh, unfortunately, is a prime target for the virus. And many of them, um, unfortunately, probably do have it. Um, so, you know, it's hard for the police officers to enforce social distancing or, you know, just um, homeless people um, doing what they should not do. Um, for example, I was followed by one uh, for five blocks during bl bright daylight. And um, I was told by the police officers, if somebody is mentally disturbed, then we cannot uh, do anything about it. Um, so as a resident of CB5, where are my rights? 
um, and how do we ensure that they are enforced? I think it's an important point. I think um, I think somebody else from the committee mentioned that they were feeling a de facto, um, you know, uh, curfew after after dark um, because of the same issues that you mentioned. And thank you for sharing that with us because it is it is a concern for sure. Um, so I, I don't think that we're we're going to come up with any solutions right here, but certainly an issue that has been flagged right now, um, and it'll be part of this entire report that we will send. Anyone, I have another, um, I have Natalia Bocarukina, I think I, I think I didn't pronounce that correctly, Natalia, and I'm sorry, but- okay, Natalia. first name was correct, so that's good enough. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, hi all, um, I'm also uh, a member of this community and uh, um, I would like to actually support uh, what Jill, uh, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce it correctly either, what July just said. Uh, I do not feel safe and I think a lot of uh, other member, well, a lot of other people who live uh, uh, nearby would say the same. Uh, population of homeless people and these are homeless people that have really mental problems has increased significantly. And we have uh, two shelters, so two hotels where homeless people are now, uh, well, they, they should be there, but apparently they, I don't think that they are there. They don't prefer, they prefer streets to, hot, uh, to hotels. I'm not sure why, and uh, these homeless people are very aggressive. It's not only uh, after it gets dark, it can actually be during daylight, or uh, since there are not a lot of cars outside now and there are not a lot of people outside, it's actually very dangerous. I have a dog, I cannot really walk her, not during the day, not uh, in the morning, not during uh, evening time to say nothing about uh, like later in the day because uh, these people, they are not just homeless, they, most of them actually are drug addicts and they're definitely mentally disabled. Yesterday I was passing by, I believe it was 40th Street and 5th Avenue the whole block between Fifth Avenue and Madison Avenue was like they they have scaffolding there, and uh, it has it had so many homeless people. And even if you just look their direction, they can be really unpredictable. You don't really know what to expect out of them. They can really stab you. I recently installed a citizen app on my phone, and I'm actually terrified about what's happening in the neighborhood. Um, I see a lot of reports and I would not doubt if this is done by those people. I understand that these people have to be protected as well and they have to be given like certain like rights, uh, shelters, whatnot, but it's, it's becoming really dangerous. And each time I walk outside of my building those days, I see either, I'm not sure if I pronounce it correct, I'm sorry, English is not my first language, there are like needles, there are drugs, there are people who are doing bad stuff, whether they're homeless people or we uh, also, I guess we will raise this issue tomorrow, but there's an Amazon warehouse on our street and these people, I can hardly tell them from homeless people sometimes because of things they do, how they act, and uh, yeah, so it, it has become really crazy. And I would like to address this issue. And each day it's becoming worse and worse. Um, July said that she cannot, like she doesn't feel safe to walk outside after 5 p.m. I can tell you that it can happen at any point. And since, as I mentioned, there are no, not a lot of cars now outside, you cannot even call for help. I'm walking on Fifth Avenue, I don't feel safe. Several people mentioned that they live in uh, uh, Union Square, around Union Square it's actually much safer there than it is next to Empire State Building. I don't know how it will be after the city reopens completely, but right now it's becoming worse and worse. And as I said, you cannot even look their direction because you don't know what to expect out of, of, from these people. And next to Penn, to Penn Station, it's even worse. So I cannot walk towards Sixth Avenue. Like if I exit, my, uh, if I exit the building where I live, so it's between 5th and 6th Avenue, and the only direction I can walk is towards 5th Avenue. 6th Avenue is a disaster, like walking towards 6th Avenue, between like all the restaurants on the street, which is also another issue I would like, um, I'm not sure if it's uh, during this conversation or maybe tomorrow it's better to address. There are a lot of uh, uh, restaurants uh, that just 
put out their bags and uh, these bags leak and the street is very dirty. Uh, these restaurants are situated right next to a hotel for homeless people. Uh, then two hotels actually for homeless people. Then Amazon shelter where all these people are doing crazy stuff, crazy things. I'm not saying like I as an adult am afraid to go outside. Imagine people with children. I'm sorry you're having that experience, Natalia. I'm very sorry. And I would encourage you if you see, you know, illegal activity um, to call 311. I know that that, you know, doesn't always address the immediate situation. Um, and I'm sorry you're experiencing that, but we do, we, we're taking this on board. We're going to share this with people who can address some of these issues. That's why we're having this conversation. So I appreciate you sharing. But 311, that's another thing. Uh, we, may, I, may, I, may I offer a suggestion, please? Yes, of course. Um, again, I'm sorry to interrupt, but tomorrow night's meeting isn't only about, um, you know, opening the streets and restaurants and so on. It's also uh, the Public Safety Quality of Life Committee deals with not only liquor licenses, but quality of life. So I would suggest that, uh, is it Natalia? Is that your name? Yes. Yes. If you can, please, um, Join the discussion tomorrow night and bring up the problems that you and I think July also mentioned uh, regarding safety. That's where it should be. That's the committee that should be handling this, uh, helping you deal with, uh, you know, talking to the police and so on. So if uh, I'm hoping you're free tomorrow night and you could join that discussion as well. I think it's a good opportunity. We have had I have had no, by the way, I'm chair of the board, just so that you know, I've had no, um, other than tonight's discussion, I've had no discussion or complaints about that. And it's very important. So please, if, uh, and July, you too, if it's at all possible, please um, join the conversation tomorrow evening. Thank you so much, Vicki. Okay. Mary. Yeah, I don't mean to prolong the same conversation, but you know, Renee, the first time we spoke, I said exactly the same thing that July and Natalia have said. Um, as a single woman walking around, you just don't feel safe anymore. And it's just a sad state. And even though I, I spent decades as a homeless advocate, the whole point is we need to have some place for these people to go to. They're not just homeless, they're marginally housed men that are showing up using drugs on the street. Um, it's a complicated issue, but I think if we can invest in the right solutions, it'll help. But I just wanted to let both um, July and Natalia know that um, I'm right there with you and I hope we can, can find something in the short term as well. Thanks, Mary. I hope you can join the meeting tomorrow night as well. Yeah, just I'll be there. Great, fabulous. Natalia, did you want to speak again? I see your hand up. I wanted to mention you started saying about uh, 311. Uh, 311 actually doesn't really help. There were a lot of people who filed reports with 311. And uh, if there are like issues as such, they suggest calling 911. But then, um, for example, if there are, if someone is doing drugs on the street, what are the odds, what are chances that by the time police arrives, that they would be still there, still doing the same thing? And we've been filing, like people do, from my building, I know we're filing a lot of complaints with 311 and nothing has been really pushed forward with that. And uh, another thing, so, um, what did I want to say? Yeah, so if there is another way to like... Natalia, we're losing you. Natalia? Um, We've lost Natalia. Laurie um, from, from Speaker Johnson's office would like to speak, Laurie. Okay, it's having me promote Laurie to a panelist. So she'll be joining in a sec. Love for Laurie to be a panelist. Hi, Laurie. You're muted. Hi, hi, yes, I'm unmuted now. Um, a, a couple of things, our office is getting a lot of, well, not a lot, but we're getting some complaints about feel, people feeling unsafe. Um, I was on the phone several times today um, with Midtown South, um, K 
connecting them with uh, some of our residents. Um, but I, I, two things. One is if you see illegal activity, it's always a 911. It's not a 311. Um, and the police will be there readily, or at least they should be. Um, and the other thing is I would warn people a little bit who use Citizen App that it is not a reliable app. It can, um, there are a lot of people who misuse it and think it's uh, entertainment to um, put things on that are not happening, that are not true, and the police end up being sent to these locations and it takes away from what they, where they really need to be. So just those things, always call 911. Um, you can also call our office. Um, we are picking up all our um, phone messages and acting, working as if we are in the office. And, um, and be careful of that app um, because I think it scares a lot of people unnecessarily. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, that's very good to know. Um, I think we've lost, did we lose Natalia? I know that she was speaking before and we lost her. Natalia? No. I think she yes, I'm sorry. I'm here now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, I was just actually my question was partially answered. So there was a, uh, when we call 311, when we file reports with 311, uh, they can just uh, register them, but then nothing is done, no matter how many people file a report about the same thing. So, uh, but then they suggest calling 911, which uh, I prefer not to do because police can, uh, by the time police arrives, by the, the time policemen arrive, they might there might might be no like homeless might have moved or uh drug addicts might have might might be gone so then there is nothing that can be done and still it's still the, it like it does not uh, solve the issue so the the reason that you call 911 and that you continue to call 911 about a particular area is that it the priority becomes uh raised in the precinct if they continue to hear uh from people uh from the same area you know, that this particular block, we had this problem on 36 and 7, so that the police will direct their energy there. So it, it isn't for nothing, even though I know, unfortunately, it seems that way at first. Okay, I understood. Another thing, for example, what I said about restaurants, so about cleanness of the streets, you spoke about uh, uh, trash disposal, and it's a uh, more broad issue, but what to do with uh, trash bags that are on the street? And uh, uh, I think that sometimes streets are not cleaned. And if there is scaffolding or a building that is uh, not being repaired, and now in the current situation of the COVID, uh, I think that uh, some uh, buildings won't even have money to do anything. And uh, so these actually, uh, these factors attract a lot of homeless people too. And uh, then they can like uh, use places as bathrooms, you know, not just as a place for them to sleep outside, but also as toilet. Right. Um, I think in, in terms of the streets that are unclean, if you contact our board office with very specific details, I think that we can work with the agencies to find out what is going on. I mean, I, I don't know specifically the streets that you're, I think you said Sixth Avenue around 40th Street. Um, I don't know that right now street the the um, the the schedule for street cleaning. I don't know if it's been reduced in that area, Laurie. I don't know if you know that. I know that actually it's thirty fifth Street between Fifth Avenue and Sixth Avenue. There is a lot of there uh, there are a lot of buildings that uh, have scaffolding, and uh, that's actually really probably better home for well, that's what they consider homeless people and uh, other weird people uh, than hotels, which are nearby. Well, I guess, you know, I mean, Renee is right. You can contact our office or um, you can contact Luke at CB5. And, you know, when people do that, uh, I often walk work with Luke on something like that. Um, we contact all the relevant agencies. Um, it's not just DSNY, but it'll be NYPD and it'll be the outreach agencies as well. Um, Again, it's it's one of those issues that if you keep calling 311, I know you don't, if you send it to us, you know, we can act on it. Um, it's something that if they continue to go out, um, it will get taken care of. Okay, and can I just uh, uh, ask one last question? Yes. 
Yes, please do. So thank you. I know that the uh, uh, hotels on my street were, well, they're now used for homeless. Is it something that will continue or is it just for the time of uh, COVID? Or like, do you know how things will develop? Because yeah, like uh, to go to the train station, I actually have to pass two hotels on the street, which are used by homeless people now. So will I have to worry that something might happen to me, let's say next year, if I go that direction? I, I, I think um, a couple of things, as Laurie mentioned, you can contact our board office. I think some of the, the hotels um, that are in our district, they work very closely with the board office and they try to work to minimize any um, danger to people on the street from their clients. And so I think you can work with Laurie and Luke um, if you'd like to call them um, about particular locations. And I think in terms of moving forward, I think things are, uh, you know, I, I don't have any deep insight into what the future holds with regard to the hotels and the homeless. I'd say Joseph might have more information. Laurie would might be able to speak to that Vicky, more um, clearly than I could. I'll, I'll just chime in if you don't mind, um, just to say that um, no one's given us a definitive answer about how long the hotel situation will last, but um, I know that the city is expecting to get reimbursed for all the expenses of this hotel project by FEMA, or at least a, a large percentage of these expenses. So, um, you know, I don't think FEMA will be able to reimburse the city after, you know, the disaster declaration is over. Um, that said, so again, that doesn't mean it's necessarily going to end, but I, I don't know how long the federal government's going to pay the city to do this. So I, I would not think it would last till next year because it's an incredibly expensive program. Yeah, I, I agree with Joseph. And I think we just don't know what, um, <laughs> it's a constantly evolving situation. And I think we just don't know what it's going to look like. Um, but I assume a year from now, hopefully it will look um, considerably different. And I, I would encourage you, Natalia, um, I believe Laurie and Luke can both work with the NCOs that are in our district. Correct. We know that they have been very stable and certain um, homeless providers that we have spoken with said that their clients actually work with them because they have been there for so long and that might be a way to temper the situation and some of the behaviors that are going on. Thank you. Any more comments? Questions, ideas. For raised hands. I think this has been a really, really good discussion. I know that um, it, it's a little bit different than our normal meeting, and it's not a very straightforward, you know, resolution support X. What I'm going to do is I've taken copious notes about everyone's point of view, everyone's concerns, everyone's suggestions and ideas. I'm going to provide that to Vicki and to the exec committee so that we can consolidate that with um, the ideas and concerns that the other uh, committees are hearing to see how we can move forward effectively to affect and address some of the, the problems and the challenges that people have um, um, raised here. But I really appreciate uh, you know, the thoughtfulness, the ideas, the thoughts, um, and, and everything that everyone shared. Does anyone else want to add anything before I close out the meeting? I do want to say to the, the BEX um, members, we still, as I mentioned, we still have the normal apparatus of the budget um, committee to, to move through. So we are at the process of doing um, borough-wide consultations. I'm going to send everyone separately um, the schedule of that, the assignments for that, um, and that is sort of separate and apart from that meeting, but I wanted to let you know to, to keep an eye on your inbox for, for that information. Does anybody have any questions? Any more comments? Okay, I just wanna thank everybody for attending tonight. Um, I look forward to see everybody tomorrow at, at the meeting for transportation, PSQL um, and parks. And, and thank you again for your participation tonight. Thank you all. Thanks, Renee. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Good night, Good night. everyone. Thank you. Bye bye.